So let's get the perspective of our, of our next guest, David Bonson. He is Chief Investment Officer over at the Bonson Group. David, uh, I, I'm guessing the answer is somewhere in between. Well, it's either somewhere in between or perhaps it's a little bit of both at the same time because I don't think those are necessarily contradictory messages. The idea that what Mike Wilson is saying that there could be more headwinds around economic resiliency in the short term is certainly true. Mike hasn't been very good about timing that and most investors are not very good about timing that because of the variable. We don't know how much of it's already priced in. But the longer term idea that most investors may need more equity exposure that could certainly be true, regardless of three, six, 12 months of economic uh, challenge. Long term, I think a lot of investors do need more equities. So I just don't see those two perspectives all that contradictory. I guess when it comes down to it, is everyone trying to understand how the Fed embarked on this very aggressive cycle of tightening monetary policy, hiking rates uh, since March of 2022 to reduce and remove some of the excesses from 2022, yet it hasn't broken the economy for some reason, even though that's kind of what you expect to happen after a year and a half of those rate hikes. Well, I think there's a couple of things. I think, first of all, it's a really unfortunate policy objective that you believe to see price stability have to break the economy. I don't believe that a lot of people have to lose their jobs in order for prices to be relatively stable. The fact of the matter is that there are elements of brokenness. We know commercial real estate is very hard to get financing right now, and they've moved a lot of this financial market activity out of the traditional banking system into non-bank lending private credit, things of that nature. But it's all but frozen up for capital markets activity with a lot of commercial real estate. It has not come down to a full widespread economic issue, and I hope it will not, but the Fed seems sometimes like they want it to. They want to proceed to the point in which there's sort of recessionary whites of their eyes, and I don't think it's a good policy objective. So it might not be a good policy objective, but like you say, it looks like at some junctures that's what the Fed is trying to do. And with that in mind, how do you structure a portfolio around that? Yeah, that's a great question because I think it behooves people to not be dependent on a valuation premium. If you really believe the Fed's going to loosen and there's going to be a big dropping of the Fed funds rate that boosts some of your high tech positions and you're going to get a re-rating of valuations from high to higher, well, that would be a way people would want to kind of use a Fed outlook to go uh, engage in a portfolio strategy. We just happen to totally disagree with that. Mm. Trying to game valuation right now is, I think, very dangerous. For one thing, because they're already pretty high. And secondly, because the Fed is the unpredictable wild card. So we choose to focus on fundamentals. The one fundamental that never lies, no matter what the Fed funds rate is, is cash flow and return of cash flow to shareholders. So dividend growth as a capital return strategy is one of the great agnostic Fed plays out there. Yeah, those cash cows will never break your heart. I am curious to hear... um uh, when it comes to the equity market, what signal you're taking from the bond market? Because this August has been uh, a wild one, if you will, for fixed income. When you're looking at Treasury yields, when you're looking at real yields at their highest levels in 10, 15 years, is that a worrisome signal for equities or how do you read that? Well, over the last four weeks, it has been. The correlation between bonds and stocks still remains extremely high. And it's not a great thing for asset allocators. You'd rather have a reverse correlation between stocks and bonds. But as the 10 years gone from 375 to 430, you've basically seen the S&P drop in concert about 4%. And, and ultimately, I believe that the long end of the curve is very high yield. If I were a fixed income investor, I would much rather have 10-year durations right now than one or two year because of the reinvestment risk. Those rates are going to go lower. And that's just simply a byproduct of global growth reality. Whether it's China, Japan, Europe, or the U.S., there's not enough global growth to sustain 4 to 5% uh, yields on the long end. And you notice the tip spreads, inflation expectations, have not grown in concert. This is almost all real yield ex uh, expansion. So I think that you've created a lot of value in the long end of the curve for bond investors, mm. but ultimately I do think it will reverse, and I think that it behooves people to have a set asset allocation that's not trying to time these things. David, really enjoyed this. Hope to catch up soon. That is David Bonson. He is Chief Investment Officer over at the Bonson Group.